Barbara, Veronica, Susanna, Sol, Luisa, Elena, Nicole, Diana, Verena, Laura, Alexandra, Maya. Um, I found the list of uh, sensory tag cases pub published by Indra on alphabet.org. And um, she wanted to introduce that program, um, women, uh, tie cases made by women. So these are the first name of the women she introduced. She's a typographer and teacher at the University of Arts from Saarbrück. And our research are about sensory style cases and also legibility and uh, classification. Yeah. Yes. Um, she's extremely prolific and fresh and has a particular view on, on type design. Et en français, je dirais qu'elle est espiègle. We are very uh, happy to welcome Indra Kupershnik. Thank you. Well, I'm not really fresh right now anymore, but that was a really good introduction. These French people, they really have a lot of energy. I thought, oh, we're starting at 7, and then we're out of here at 8.30, and then I can finally get something to eat. No. No? Oh, yeah, my presentation. Sorry. Okay. So it's going to be about fonts and uh, a special... Um, I don't know uh, what do you say, praise for the students who are talking and looking at typefaces since 9 o'clock this morning, So, and you are still here. I'm very amazed by this. <laughs> yeah, really good group you have here. Um, Sandra already said that I'm, I'm a bit interested in, interested in classifications, but it's really a hate-love thing that um, I'm doing this for a long time, and I came a little bit from a scientific background, actually, that I didn't want to, do the, uh, to study design at first at all. But um, like the typefaces and typeface classification really got me into the design profession because I thought, oh, it's just like you mix a little sand and you mix a little serif, and then uh, these are like the um, chemicals, then you put them together, and it's, it's totally scientific. So it's, it's actually the same as chemistry, which I wanted to study at first. So this is one of my favorite photos from a specimen book from photo lettering. And it, this bridge is a little bit this uh, love of the rational and the scientific, maybe, with the pretty irrational and, and subjective design field. But um, looking at typefaces is maybe still something that we can explain a little bit in more orderly than, than poster design. Um, so this talk is going to be a little bit about this myth that everyone has. Oh, I mean you know everything about me. I wanted to introduce myself. Um, I'm a typographer, so I'm not really a type designer anymore. I did some typeface design, but more in the field of bitmap fonts in, in the 2000s where um, machines were too shitty to render the typefaces themselves, so I made uh, pixel fonts for them. Now I'm also a teacher at the uh, Habi Kazar, we call it in Saarbrück. So I'm actually really close to Paris, or fast to Paris, but I'm, until recently, I didn't do a lot in France because I don't speak any French. I'm, I'm sorry that I also cannot understand anything that you <laughs> you're saying in between. So um, yeah, I should really pick up my French. Um, I'm also, I don't want to say writer, but I write. I don't, I mean, it just happened that I write and I'm busy with history, so I would also not call me a historian, but I think I, um, I'm almost more a font theorist than I'm actually <laughs> designing typefaces. And then I, of course, help and uh, like help with my knowledge to everyone who's interested in choosing fonts or de designing fonts or selling fonts and these things like this. But um, this, type this talk is going to be about fonts and that uh, there's this, um, this theory that there are too many fonts. I, I was actually just checking how many fonts are there. And if you Google that, you find all these 
these images that say there are too many fonts out there, and this is something that everyone always hears, or the type designers get that asked all the time, and there's also been written a lot about are there too many fonts out there? And then I uh, thought like, okay, I'll check how choosing fonts works. And this suggests really, this is so rational, just the first images that come up uh, on Google. It looks like a highly scientific process. You just follow the flow chart and eventually you come out at this typeface and then it's the perfect typeface for your job. And y we all know that it's not the period, like this, uh, this table of periodic typefaces, um, how the world is looking like. Um, so what could be the things that we are uh, thinking about? And I'm, I'm a little bit demystifying some of these theories maybe. So this is what we get asked a lot and then the type designers ask, uh, say something like, no, no, because uh, fonts are just like wine or chocolate or shoes or clothes. Or and some of these comparisons you read all the time work better than others, for instance, I don't know, music or something digital might work a little better than things that I used up at some point. So if I, need, if I eat my Haribo, I need new Haribo, of course, but um, something digital that doesn't have a lifespan, that is actually a little closer to digital fonts today. So I can still play the music that I bought 20 years ago, and so you can also still use the fonts that you bought 20 years ago. So why would I need any new ones when these files still perfectly work? But um, all, all here in the room, I think, know the answer, actually, that typefaces um, communicate a lot more than just the text that they come in. So this is one of my favorite quotes by uh, a typographer in Germany, Hans-Peter Wilbeck, and he says that before we actually, or we don't only read the typefaces, but we also look at them and we, we like, uh, see if this is actually something we want to read before we read it. But then on the other hand, we should also maybe not overestimate our profession. This is a quote that gets us back on earth from Erich Spiekermann, like, if we need to read this, then we will read it anyway, and we will read it in Arial, and maybe it's uh, like, it's, it's a thing that we talk ourselves into. Yeah, typefaces are so important and we need a lot of typefaces and good typography. But if you read like a, a warning sign in Areal and you need to get out of that building, you will absolutely read it also in Areal. And well, so there's, there's, this is like the, the, the polls that we are working in. Um, this is the second poll that I'm going to, like the second set of polls that I'm talking about. The typefaces that, um, like the use of a typeface that is very, very visual and the, um, the idea here is that you, you notice it before you're actually not reading the text but you are supposed to look at this, this poster. And on the other side of the extreme is the very readable setting, the legible typeface, the legible, legible setting of text that you're supposed to read for a long time. So these are the two extremes. I cannot really demonstrate it like you don't hear me anymore, but um, everything else, like all the mixed uses of typefaces, happen between those things. So grabbing attention without actually reading really, or just getting into the background and making reading really easy and, and information really perceptible. And everything that you are working on, you have to think like, oh, is it more like something that I need a typeface that, uh, that grabs attention, or is, is legibility a little bit more important? The problem with choosing typefaces compared to this world, or at least this wood type world, is that typefaces don't really come in a, in a set size anymore as they were in, I don't want to say metal type or wood type, but we, we still can use that today, but like in the uh, materialized font world, you could never set a poster typeface in small sizes because, uh, because that font just comes with this one size and a body copy typeface, you could never use it at really large sizes. So there were almost no, at least no improper sizing. And this is something that you have to now figure out of this typeface, oh, is this something that I should use large or this is something that I should use rather small? And also all the optimizations are happening or they, they, they were, that they come with a font so that you have to set something like maybe a little tighter or a little uh, loosely spaced. That was all built in and it was actually a little easier to use typefaces back then because there was at least not the misuse that you use a typeface which is meant for display for really small sizes and that, that fails now or something. But even if you, um, if you choose just a text typeface 
and blend out this whole display world, there are so many flavors you can go into or directions you could go into. There are just text typefaces that say more, I'm a, I'm a novel, I'm, a, I'm poetry or something, and other text typefaces that say, I'm a newspaper, I have serious information, you can believe me. And that has a little bit, of course, to do, or a lot to do with the typography that people are doing with. So this has, of course, more line spacing than the other one and wider columns. So not everything that I'm talking about today is really just the cause or the, the, like the, the fault of the typeface. But um, a lot of this, like this in built-in flavor is coming with the proportions that are in the typefaces. And on the web, like for a long time, everything just looked the same because we used the same fonts until the type designer said, no, you should use web fonts. And now we're using the same two web fonts on the web for everything. So choosing typefaces is not difficult at all, I think, or we could be more daring. But uh, everyone who tells you, including me, Choosing typefaces works like this. You can forget about that too, because that it's not. There's not one rule that you could follow uh, that you can follow, and then everything is fine. So it's just you have to feel it out, and it's going to be different every uh, in every case. Um, but if you want to choose typefaces, even without any rules, um, it helps to see differences between typefaces. My mother doesn't even see differences between a serif and a sans serif, so. Okay, so then it's really hard to explain her what she should choose, but you could stare at typefaces for a long time and then you see, oh, this is, this are, these are all two serif faces, but they differ in a little bit. So this is something that, well, my mother not would see, but most of the people here would say, okay, there are serif typefaces and then there are sans serif typefaces. But if you look at these two groups, you see some of the serif typefaces also look totally different and uh, some sans serif typefaces look very different in principle, and you could never really make like the other one in the corner from just reducing the contrast or like just reducing the like making the thins thicker and or cutting off the serifs wouldn't give you the other one. But if you just cut off the serifs and reduce the contrast from this first one here, you can like a Bodoni, you could get something out like Helvetica roughly. And so there are almost like two principles, or at least on this slide, or almost three principles of typefaces, at least for text typefaces, that are very influential and that you can see in a lot of different typefaces. And this is, is helping you later on to choose the typefaces. And this is, oh, it's not really s visible here, but this is related to the tool that these typefaces way back then were, were made with for the first time when these, these forms came up they were made with uh, different kind of writing tools. So you have a different, um, a different say, range of contrast or just different forms that, that are a little influenced by the writing tool. And these are like the broad nib pen and the pointed nib. And this is based on the theories of Gerrit Nordzei, but I added something like the, we have uh, Redesfeder in Germany a lot or speedball. Um, nib that has a round plate in at the front, so it doesn't produce any contrast at all. And you could associate this with the geometric typefaces. So these are like, if you just took look at these three groups, a lot of typefaces, more or less text typefaces, more or less fitting into these three, say, directions or principles that are, they're based on. And furthermore, you can also check, like, how do the the strokes end, are they, like, are they cut off diagonally or are they cut off horizontally or maybe even vertically. You can uh, check the proportions of the mostly vertical, uh, verticals, uh, basal, um, capital letters. Are they very different or are they very close to each other, the proportions, or have the, the, the same width? And um, also, like, there's the, the, the typographers call this the, the contrast, axis of the contrast. So the, the, the middle group has a vertical contrast, we say. And the, what is this? The, the left group has a diagonal contrast. And then you see, like, the, the, the principle of the forms that are developing here. And if you start paying attention to this, you can see that in other printing type faces also that have a different, um, uh, a, a different feature or something. So that was what we could call like the humanist principle, the rational or more static principle with the closed forms. If you just look at the counters and the, the terminals and then the geometric constructed or round principle. 
And as I said, that is also still visible if you add slap serifs to the mix or you have a sense serif that has still contrast. And you can even extend this further and further. Of course, you can also include the script typefaces that are based on these tools. But the idea is actually that you're not only dividing everything into sans and serif, but that you also see form principles in these, in these typefaces that relate to each other. Because that gives you a lot of uh, information on how maybe the feel or the atmosphere of these typefaces are compared to others. So this is, of course, a, a lot of stuff that these typefaces are still differing. So you could check. How are the serifs in this typeface? Uh, are they uh, they're known? Uh, maybe a little? Is the how is the contrast? Is it high? Is it low? And all these kind of things, just to give you a little bit more vocabulary than just sans and serif, um, because my theory, it's of course highly subjective, is uh, subjective, is that you can associate certain adjectives, adjectives to these groups if you if you are looking at the principle of the form. So these humanist typefaces always look a little more approachable, maybe, or friendly is the thing that every client of uh, you will ever choose a typeface for will say they want to look friendly. But they look a little, may maybe a little warmer because the forms are more of a riot, they are more different, it's not as repet repetitive, it's maybe also feeling a little personal. So these are my adjectives, but maybe you find a different set of adjectives that you could associate this group of typefaces with. And then you maybe just write it down and it helps you to choose a typeface with that brief later on. And this middle group is a little bit more strict and more rational maybe, or also uh, a little stiff and it comes off a little bit more authoritative and uh, correct or something like um, also it here it differs, uh, differs a lot but if you choose the Bodoni which is more classy or maybe I don't know, fashionable, but all these adjectives also come, of course, with uh, the uses that these typefaces have been used for in the past. For instance, this this group, the the the, the typefaces like Futura, I still think that is like um, it's it's modernist when it when it because that is the period when they first appeared. But there are also companies in Germany that use that typeface for many many years and not using them anymore, like uh, Volkswagen or um, like the the Red Wing uh, Democratic Party used this typeface and I still connect it with like democracy and the people and it's, it's more informal and I still connect it with Volkswagen although they replaced that typeface like half a year ago or something. Or you, you will have maybe different associations. They also mean something else in different countries. For instance, the geometric more Art Deco typefaces in Italy were more related to the fascist regime and not like black letters that they are in, in Germany. Uh, of course, I'm totally exaggerating here when I'm meaning the full family when I say this, but also the styles within a family like feel very different. Like italic always feels a little bit more dynamic or forward going or maybe elegant. Or, and we talked about this, how, <laughs> how the, the capitals like caps only setting always mean a little bit like I, at least for the Germans. Maybe it's also like because you are in Alsace. Uh, it's that um, we connect authority and, and distance and, and maybe some, some official information with this. Although I think in, in America or U the U UK, who use a lot of all cap setting, they don't have that feeling at all. So this, this um, I don't know, everything that was is, uh, expressed before in the discussion, that might be completely different in other countries. But Germans just don't use all cap setting almost at all. Like everything that we do is usually, uh, mixed case and that comes a little bit on my theory is that it comes from we used a black letter for so many years that you cannot never use black letter in all caps because it's completely unreadable but maybe we are trained to just use mixed case setting in newspapers in books on posters and and uh, countries that have a rich wood type and display typeface uh, history they use it maybe in a completely different but don't use it with script typefaces this is why I grade this out um, it also, that, that looking at these typefaces in groups or principles also helps with combining the typefaces, which brings us to this, that uh, I recently heard that you should never pour, uh, pair more than two families. I think this is completely, I don't want to say bullshit, uh, rubbish, um, because 
sure, if, if it fits, you can combine five typefaces. If it looks great, I think uh, you have to judge this on a case-by-case -case basis and also what the typefaces are, of course. And you should really be more daring. I don't, I don't think that uh, a, a lot, I hear a lot of people like, oh, I stick to the same super family with Dingsbum Serif and Dingsbum Sans because uh, I don't know how to combine the typefaces, but just try it out and see how it looks like. And you can make something also really exciting by maybe combining two typefaces that are a little weird. But if you want to combine something very harmoniously, you can just stick in one of these columns, so something like Budoni always goes well with Helvetica or Slab Serif or like a Clarendon uh, style typeface. Or you should be, like also you should choose something completely different. So if you combine stuff diagonally, that is also a safe bet. So if you go for a large contrast, that's also pretty easy. But two typefaces that in this uh, image stand next to each other on a horizontal line, they are maybe a little bit too too close or it could look weird if you combine Garamond with Bodoni, it, it may be a little off. So either go in the same principle maybe or do something completely different. Of course, a family comes with more styles, so you can always say, I want a bold typeface, like a bold sans serif combined with a lighter serif that is also always working, sort of. You could also say, I want um, like a medium weight in for the text and uh, a lighter style for the headlines. So size, of course, is always helping also to make something completely different. And uh, something also from the same era or the same location or the same designer is always, it's, it's not always, but it can be a starting point. For instance, these are those typefaces from the 1930s that have this, I don't know, uh, certain spirit that they would combine pretty well. Or you could combine, of course, different styles from a really large family that you pick something wider for small text, something for the body copy in between here, and something really, really condensed and large for the headlines. Um, but that brings me to this uh, theory that people sometimes feel that they need the full family, which is not the case at all, at least not if you have a large family like this, because then you end up on this old store of them, and you think, are they nuts? I mean, it's $1,400, I mean, who can pay this? But you don't need uh, 56 styles or 100 styles of a family. It's just, it's your options are larger. So you can pick the styles that you need, and you see that one style is actually just $25 in this case, and if you pick four of those, that's still a reasonable price. So this is just as, as long as we don't have dynamic font formats that can uh, interpolate exactly what you want, you m might want a large family to choose like the light condensed and the white bold from this. Or there are also of course typefaces that have built in variations in one font file themselves. Um, so with open type features you can access different variations for certain letters or different sets of variations. This is called stylistic sets. Who ever found this in InDesign, how you use stylistic sets? Jean-Francois, yeah, okay, no, you're not counting. Anyone else ever used open type features? One, two, three. Okay, no more hands, don't be shy because this is otherwise embarrassing. Okay, but I see it's all the typeface designers. You know how this works. It's really hard to use in design applications, but the typeface designers make really fun and useful features for you that you could <laughs> maybe explore and no one knows about them. So the typeface I'm also using for the presentation is called Output by David Johnson Ross, and he has three uh, stylistic sets in them. So look at the terminal, as I said before. You have the horizontal terminals in the first line, you have the diagonal terminals in the second line, and the very vertical endings and they each give a little bit of a different flavor. So you have the more strict image maybe on top, and then the bottom line looks like a different typeface, but it's all the same font e just by activating a different stylistic set. Um, you could change the flavor within just this one font. Or this example below is Fakt by Thomas Thiemich, and he has alternate an alternate set of geometric uh, lowercase letters or also some of the uppercase are very different. So you can actually make something like Futura out of something that looks like Helvetica and completely change the flavor of the typeface without buying a second typeface. So it's also really cheap if you, uh, if you pick this. I mean, if you want two typefaces and you can only buy one, then you should pick something that, is, uh, that has uh, stylistic sets or stylistic 
alternatives built in them. And then you can make a modernist typeface out of this, but you also see that it's not as easy to identify or read because then you get in this is this now apting or opting? We should ask the people in the last row because it's, I mean, the simplified forms are also a little harder to read than the, the more different um, forms. And then people talk about legibility. This is a really trendy topic. Now you have to, we have to do re legibility research and legible typefaces. And this is something that I'm, yeah, you introduced me as someone I'm actually against all the legibility <laughs> research, but don't progress, uh, broadcast this on the internet. Sorry, but um, I was in, in a dean, like in, 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 in a committee for norming legibility uh, or typefaces in Germany for three years and, all right, legibility. So look at what people are saying about legibility. They usually say something like, yeah, you need, uh, the typeface should form good words and good lines and they should be really like uh, different and clear forms so that they cannot be confused with each other and I think this is true. So something that looks like an O, an A that looks like an O, it is easier to confuse. And then you need open counters because otherwise they're filling in on, in, in small sizes or on the screen. And then people make this lazy blurring screen. Oh, you don't almost see anything, but this is maybe a good test. So what typeface can you almost like identify still? It's uh, if, if it gets really difficult, then maybe an R, an R and an N. We used up three microphones. For the so you can simulate some of the effects that are happening, but it's never really, really what is happening in your eye. And Eric van Blockland is a designer who really wanted to find out so what is happening in the eye. You can also not really make it out, but he has three ends on the screen. And he measured or he actually calculated how the light is reacting or like how the light is is jumping around on the white surface. So everything that is blurry or like colorful, colorful straight lines, this is actually the light, which is of course not white as we know, but it's built up of different colors. And then these black shapes are the black letters on the white surface. And what he saw is that the, the, the light is jumping into the letter forms. So at the end of the day, the more beef or material you have, the more is left over to be seen by your eye. If you have really small letters and the light is jumping into these black forms, almost nothing is left to read, be read by your eyes. So first, something larger is easier to read than something small, which is not really surprising. But also this fight between is a sans serif or a serif better to, to e or easier to read. It's almost like if you have elephant-like serifs on there or really sturdy serifs, they just stay a little longer. And you see that the middle part of the stroke uh, disappears a little in the second N. But since you see the serifs, down there, you can still make out an end, sort of. So they help because they just have, th it's more material that can be uh, like sucked up by the light. Uh, so, if, so if you want to really choose a legible typeface, choose something that is not too thin, choose a, a size that is not too small, and maybe have something like a serif if you want to, but if you don't want a serif, that's also fine, since serif typefaces are also really readable. But don't choose a super thin weight, maybe, because that is just gets sucked up by the light. So now you have like all these 3,000 typefaces out there, or even more. And what do you do if you just want to like not look at all of them all at the same time? So what I said is, of course, you could look at something like only one genre that is fitting your task. You should maybe listen to your clients. So th these, I actually never really think about the first two. I usually write, jump to the third, but of course you should listen to the client, what do you want to say, what is the task, is, this, is it a, like a book series or is it a website, is it a signage system? Of course this has influence on the typeface and the readership and the target group. But for me, oftentimes when I'm choosing a typeface or I'm talking to the client for a first time, while he did not even finish the sentence, I'm already like, oh, what do you want? What do you want to make a dynamic typeface? Is it like humanist? Oh, this could be a humanist sense error, blah, blah, blah. So I'm already in this, what field do you want? What, what form model would I, or like what principle would I'm looking for? And if I then just look in that group, I don't have to look at 
all of the other typefaces because still that is a large group if you just say I want something something more stiff or authoritative and then I look in that group it is already enough and I don't limit myself or I don't narrow it down immediately to serif or slab because you uh, or serif or slab or sans because you can you can say the same things with that it's not that you should decide yourself at first do you want sans or serif that's not the that's not the biggest question, but what atmosphere or w what would fit here. And then, of course, something like location and history is really important. Is it, as I said, a typeface uh, says something else in a different country, or um, you go back to the history of the client or what they, what they are looking for. And then there are these not so cool factors that people are not talking about all the time. It's like, um, what kind of reading is this? Like, is it very structured content that I just read snippets from, or is this a novel I want to read for a long time? Uh, how is this printed or produced, or is it on screen? Is it on what screen is it? Is it, can I, can I change the reading distance? So if, if it's something that's really small, that doesn't mean it's, it's unreadable for me, because maybe I can go closer to it and then read it. So if, if I can change the size or the reading distance, then it's, it's also a little bit more adaptable. And then in the end, it's also really something like, is it available for licensing? What does it cost? Is it a good typeface that I uh, that will not crash any of the, or make any, uh, crashing is not really the problem anymore, but it gives me problems in the uh, production period. And the cost is something that I didn't even listen uh, listed here. I put it like behind the word licensing. But in the end of the day, this is also a big uh, issue, at least for also freelance or beginning designers, that they cannot just license every single large family that they want. Um, so we talked about typefaces that are very, very thin and super attractive on screen, maybe all th they look good, but they just don't read that well. So if you want graphic design that people like to look at, and it, which is gives a nice gray field, then thin typefaces are maybe nice, but otherwise if you want to make something readable, you should choose something that is, has more beef and it's also um, the same on print and screen, you would think that this is very different, but it's actually not so different. You, if, if you know about difficult printing conditions, it really relates also to difficult screen conditions. So this is, for instance, different papers have also very much influence on how the typeface then finally looks in the product. This is um, the letterpress on letterpress printed on really rough paper. So this this seems thick and sturdy by itself. It doesn't have to have just the typeface. But if you use a already high contrast typeface and then print it offset or on super slick coated paper, it just flickers and you don't uh, you can't read anything at all anymore. It's a this is from a book by Paul Rand that I really really would like to read, but for years I can only read like two pages and then I, I feel like, eh, eh, problems of readability. Um, uh, so this is almost the same thing that is happening on high resolution screens with very contrasty typefaces that they look too spiky and, and not really attractive to read. Um, and we talked about this earlier, so this, uh, this photo is actually for Dave, that um, when they developed newspaper typefaces, it was really also the printing, uh, almost like the form making process that determined the look of the typeface a little because you had to make these round plates that the newspaper was printed from. And by, uh, for making these plates, you needed these paper mache molds. And the typefaces that were on Vogue that, uh, by that time, they were just not, they were just breaking by, by making, uh, like, by having to go through this process. So also a technology can result into a new style of typefaces or new features for typefaces because you just have to answer different technological problems there. This is also some, this something that I mentioned with the students. Rotogravure is something that is maybe not as present today, but this is everything that is very high volume printing, like catalogs, magazines, is printed in that uh, printing technology where everything is dissolved into little dots. And that looks super good for photos, but it's very bad for typefaces. So if you know that your job or your client needs to print something uh, in this technology, I had that, for instance, for a, ma a huge mail order catalog company. Uh, they tested the regular style of the typeface, and it just it di it, it, it didn't print at all. So you, we had to actually make the typeface a little bolder to withstand this, uh, this printing process. 
And then you have stuff like that, that is backlit. This is also just lame Photoshop, but you get the idea that something that is lit from the, the other side gets bolder and maybe needs a thinner typeface and is more spaced out. Then uh, a sign maybe in the same building that is just lit up from front. If you want the, bo the two to look the same, you need a little bit of a thinner version for the backlit. So typefaces that were designed especially for signage system, really complex signage system, have different versions that are a little bit thinner but uh, use the same space. This is not existing anymore, something like a lexicon, but sometimes you need just, you have text that is read in snippets and you need to have these keywords stand out really well. So you need a typeface that has a really, really cre clear bold and uh, a nice compact uh, text version or something, but you also need all kinds of symbols and maybe Greek or phonetic alphabets. So whatever your text or the content um, is, is like the problems that your content is giving you are of course also keys for the typeface that you have to select. Um, different languages look completely different also in different uh, typefaces. For instance, the English or also the German very much like these super large, tall egg sites. This is a typeface by, by Gerhard Unger for a newspaper and you see it's very compact. It looks extremely large, although it's maybe like five or six point. And that works well for English because they don't have any diacritical marks and you can, uh, you can set it really tight. But if you set a different language in the same typeface that has, for instance, a lot of diacritics a lot uh, above the X side, like uh, um, Hungarian or any of the East European languages. It's just not enough space above the lowercase letter. So you need something that has a little lower X side and maybe also different features um, that like you need to know a little or sense a little uh, the language that your, your text will be set in because like German, I, I, I'm, I'm curious if you can find it out, like the different languages from, from the different gray value, but German has really long words and a lot of capitals. So if we have our capital letters stand out really like prominently, then it's so annoying in the, in the text. But for instance, if you said something English, then the capital letter is, using, uh, is usually just saying the beginning of a new sentence. So that's actually helpful if they say, hey, I'm a new sentence now, or I'm an important word. So for English, this is almost like um, desirable to have prominent large capitals, but for other type, uh, like other languages, it's, it's not at all. Also high uh, X side typefaces and wide proportions are really good for small text on screen. So you almost have like everything that was done for newspaper printing and all these sturdy typefaces, they work really well for small text on screen as well, at, at least if they are not too compact or too tightly spaced. And uh, you have like typefaces that look almost ridiculous if you scale them up, but if you look the, at them like it's the same typeface, or it's not exactly the same typeface, but if you look at them in small, then it's, it's going away a little. So here you see two versions of the same typeface, uh, bent and modern, like in this resolution test up top, but you see that the exaggerated version uh, renders much better in small sizes on screen because they're just more pixels that you could render this typeface with. And you're never supposed to see it in large sizes. Um, Fontbro made actually for all the genres that are popular, made a small version, like small sized version that you could use for really tiny text uh, on the screen. And they are all a little like exaggerating all the features and, and proportions of a typeface, but you should never use them like above 14 or 16 pixel. Um, that's the, the, the family that I was um, just mentioning, Benton Modern, is one of the more extensive ones because it also has not only the screen size, but also um, fonts for, for text and versions for display. And this is all of these styles, or a, a couple of these styles set at the same size. But this is how you should never use that or actually see the typeface, but this is how you should see the typeface. And if you now compare the display styles, which are really tight and and, and, and um, like very detailed and have high contrast. And all of this would be completely gone if the small size versions would not be exaggerated and also drawn really sturdy. But if you see them in these, like in these related sizes, you think like, oh yeah, they are the same family and that doesn't look so ridiculous. So these are all just the regular styles of uh, the display. Uh, they have a display uh, compressed. 
condensed, narrow, and a, and a normal width of the display. And then this pack in, in the bottom, the four ones, these are actually not optical sizes are what the typeface designers are calling this a lot. These are um, variants of the same uh, intended size, like these are all variants of the text typeface that have a little bit different stroke thickness, but you, you see that they are not uh, of different widths, so this is called grades. And then you have the super small one. And the grades are also coming from newspaper design and printing because then you can um, like equalize something like he has a different paper and it in a different climate and maybe a different machine. And uh, like on the signage um, example, that something will look thicker than on paper. So you use a little bit of a thinner variation to just uh, even this out. But I make sure it's this is a little, that's maybe a little overrated of a problem. But there are a lot of, uh, a handful of newspaper typefaces that um, uh, do this. And we did a demo site for, I did a, a work on a demo site for web type uh, to demonstrate the, like what the series can do or what, what use you can get out of using different optical sizes. And this is not how the site now looks like, but I just show this because of this little toggle in the corner. So this is like what I can do on the web. It's not really complex. Um, I made this, this demo just because of this toggle, because if you uncheck this, it switches to just one font or just one family, just the regular style. So you see you have the displays for the headlines and the masthead, and then you have the text or like the, um, the regular size for this a larger introduction and you have the small size one for the smaller text. But if you just switch it to the larger, uh, like the text version, you see the headlines are not so punchy or attractive anymore. The masthead just scrolled out of the window. And also the small sizes, that doesn't really hold up because it's spaced too tightly. It doesn't, it do, it's not really readable in the small sizes. So if you use the appropriate optical size or the size specific designs, you can make something much more fitting or uh, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it just gives the more appropriate feel for this thing and you, you have the idea like, like the display sizes or the display things really shout or like are really attractive and the small stuff is also really readable. And the second thing that you could do with these different widths is for instance, if you look at the headline and the window would get wider, you could use uh, a, a wider width of the same typeface. So instead of using the compressed, you can use a condensed or something. And uh, instead of the condensed, you see the normal widths and the small ones. And if you have a really small size, then it switches off these display styles entirely and you just have the medium size one for the headlines and only use the, the really small ones. So this is something that can be really useful for responsive design also to just make it all fit the window size that you are working with. This is how the website uh, looks right now, or even like, like it's a little different in, in depending on the browser because it uses, it's a demo site, it uses a lot of open type features that were not available in my browser when I took the screenshot. But you could just um, uh, play with it a little and then change the window size of the, of the uh, website and see what, uh, what is reacting. We also have something like a formal version uh, of the design and uh, an expressive version. Do I have a, no, I don't have a screenshot of this. And this is using the same HTML, but it's switching between different CSS files. So by having this expressive layout, it looks completely different, but it's exactly the same content. And I didn't do the design that was by Marco Dugoncic, but I just wrote all the texts and it explains the concept of optical sizes and grades again and what you could do with, with these things. I also have an old list on my website. You mentioned all the lists that I make for websites sometimes that lists a lot of typefaces that have grades or optical sizes just in case you want to maybe play around th with this a little. Um, yeah, this is also something that uh, especially typeface designers tell you, they're no bad typefaces, uh, they're just bad uses of the typefaces, or it's like every typeface has the appropriate use, but no, I think they are also bad typefaces in that they are maybe badly produced or badly drawn. So it, I don't even speak about the design idea here, but um, this was, uh, I found this in an old specimen, so this was it's maybe also related to the use, but if you have a script that is not connecting, then it's not a good script. Because, I mean, this is not the case in the case of Reporter, but I've seen this, especially with free script fonts or pirated versions, that you have a connecting script that is not actually connecting, or you have something like, um, 
um, the metal type times had more the problem that this was not cast properly, so the baseline was jumping. But I think there are still, uh, especially in digital type, there are some things that she should pay attention to. So is the spacing even? Does it look even in a line? Or is it like sometimes uh, letter combinations look closer to each other and sometimes not? That is just not a good typeface because typeface designers try to make this very even. Or that you should have kerning for really complicated um, uh, letter combinations. If, if some of the letters appear a little bolder than other ones, or strokes appear bolder and other strokes that should be the same thickness are little, uh, give you uneven color, then this is also just a bad typeface. And then sometimes you need a typeface for the screen and it renders really shittily, then maybe the typeface design is not horrible, but the technical optimization is einfach not, uh, is einfach not, uh, it's just not good enough. I'm uh, mixing some German in here, I need another beer. Um, uh, so if you have bad rendering, then uh, that is at least not a good web font and should not probably not be sold as one. Oh, of course, that the like the European languages know the problem that you don't have the accents or you don't have an S set in this free typeface or umlauts are missing. Like basic diacritics are not present in the typeface, then I would say it's, it's an unusable uh, typeface. And then stuff that is uh, related to the drawing. So if you don't have smooth curves or like when a curve gets into a straight and it looks like it there is a corner, then it's maybe not drawn well if it's not supposed to be like this or optical corrections when you have a circle and, and then you just draw a stroke next to it and you say that this is a sans serif A this is not as easy so you have a lot of optical corrections built in the typefaces that all you type designers have to learn of or about in the next five weeks but I'm sure that you will do so this makes a good typeface this is a fun book by uh, Peter Caro from the late 80s and he analyzed early digitizations from typefaces and they're actually really bad. Like the, the versions of Palatino or Helvetica that come with your system, they, are, they were all like made in a rush when they needed these first digital typefaces in the, in the late 80s. And uh, sometimes they were digitized from drawings and they were not copying like the same serif to other typefaces. So all serifs are little different and sometimes you have a, a hook there or you have a round somewhere or something like in this nine, it's, it's changing the stroke thickness. And this is something that um, you can see oftentimes if you take the effort to make a comparison like this, see in very early digital versions. And still, they are still out there and they're still sold by companies I will not name. But um, this uh, gets me to this point that um, if we should use new typefaces, are new typefaces better than old typefaces? I would say you can use all the classics. There are so many typefaces that are a little older now, but are still super interesting, and you don't have to feel like, I need, uh, I need to use the typefaces that were designed today, but new versions of old classics are usually the better idea, or are usually of better quality than early digitizations. Uh, I once made a, a demo site or website about Neue Haas Grotesque, which is the name of Helvetica before Helvetica, and it's also the name of the new version that Christo Christian Schwartz made in maybe the mid 2000s, and he really got back to the the original Neue Haas grotesque and the original drawings and restored uh, how Helvetica was meant to look like. And you see, the top version is what comes with your system, and it's just, for instance, that version doesn't have a real italic; it's just slanted Romans, and once you've seen this, or once you've seen the eight, you cannot unsee it anymore because the the slanted Helvetica is so horrible. So I'm not I'm not a big Helvetica fan, although some people think that of me. And I'm also I don't want you to tell uh, I want to tell you that people should use Helvetica. But if you want to use Helvetica in 2016, you should really use Neue Haas Grotesque and not the system version. Or even not Neue Helvetica is pretty ugly. It it has is ugly for different reasons. But uh, that's a different talk. So um, you should. Not, o not particularly use the new designs, but new digitizations are usually a better idea or the better versions. But as I said, you can also, uh, if you want to use a new typeface that sometimes is also a rediscovered one or one that is just not so much used or little seen because it was forgotten and it's not packaged up with one of the big CDs that everyone has. So 
you can you can be unique by using a very new typeface, or you can also be unique or new by rediscovering a typeface that is not so overused. And of course, that is uh, always depending a little bit on fashion. What is what is in fashion right now? So yeah, the, like a lot of graphic designers who don't have a lot of experience are now asking, yeah, and why? Sh where should I get these from? It's not, of course, you can get them from retailers, but that's not what I'm actually saying because you will not never find or discover a typeface on a retail side, like on a distributor side. Um, you can discover typefaces more maybe on a in a curated collection. This is also a tool that lets you test typefaces really easily. Um, by you can activate it for free for an hour or you can just rent it by the month so you can try out a lot of typefaces and what I also like is that uh, previously if you license a typeface and it costs you a lot of money then you also feel like you have to use it for the next job or you only choose in the pool of the typefaces that you previously bought but if you only rent a typeface or you buy it for a little small money then you you feel like you can use a new typeface every time. That's also what people use on the web because you're not, you're not really licensing web fonts or um, like to have a pool and then it's, it's usually you license a new web font or you um, rent a new web font for uh, every new project. With web fonts, it's really easy to try out new typefaces because if you have a website up already, you can use one of these swapper tools. FontShop is offering one. This is the one from FontShop, also one from WebType, where you could just uh, change all the, the, like the headlines to a different typeface or all the, the body copy to a different typeface and check immediately like how your website will look like in this other set of font fonts. This is not so easy if you have print content or nothing on the web, but still it gives you a little idea. You can just try it out with the uh, New York Times or any website that is out there to see if this is a good web font or not. Then there are also blogs and uh, resources, of course, that write about typefaces a lot. Uh, Typographica is a site that has uh, reviews of typefaces every year where like people write about the typeface they like that's not really it's not the best typefaces of the year, but you could say it's at least an interesting typeface uh, for someone. And they also have basic classification that's that you think like, oh, I need a maybe a new serif typeface that came out in the, la in the past uh, eight years, then you could uh, check there. Oh, this is a database I was involved in for a long time, Fonts in Use, that is collecting type usage. So you could search by the industry or by the format, and you can search maybe for signage and even for a location, and then see other uses that other designers did. And you can see, oh, what typefaces did they? Maybe it's, it's a little bit inspiring to check out what typefaces are, uh, typefaces are people using for books these days. So you can just sort by industry. You could think, oh, I, I need something that is, uh, works for the film industry or something that uh, works for posters. And then you can just uh, check out different uses. Or you can go via typeface. This is not all the typefaces that are on there, just the most common ones. And then see, like, OK, how is Folio working in use, really? And what do people do with this typeface? So it gives you a good idea. There are, of course, also like digital specimens, like the font book, or my fonts also has an app where you can check out typefaces and set certain text with it. But I'm also still uh, a fan or, or a collector of printed specimens, and a lot of type designers are still putting out printed specimens that, of course, don't give you a good idea what that typeface looks on screen, but it just has, uh, it suggests to you where do the type designers see that typeface? Like in what area or what kind of use could this be? This is um, specimens by one of, uh, like these are one of my favorite sets of specimens by Nicola Durek. He really, I think, makes the best type specimens right now. Uh, this is one um, that lets you also combine typefaces in, in, uh, in one publication. I think this is from Typotech. But this is something I found really great because it refers back to one of my favorite specimens, which is from a long time ago from Linotype, that lets you select different Linotype text faces and then combine them with different header typefaces to emulate a typical magazine or newspaper design. So this is not really interactive as you would have it on screen, but it still gives you a good idea also what typeface uh, look together or could work together uh, in, 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 the, in the realistic use. So it's like combining typefaces uh, in pa on paper. So to just uh, release you from this talk, uh, to sum that up that of course you should 
you could go via the genre more than just thinking of uh, sans serif or serif. Maybe see the world a little bit more like like the humanist or a little friendlier typefaces and a little bit more static or rational typefaces. That gives you a better idea of the atmosphere they will convey. And you could try to not use all the safe bets, as I said, them all the, the, the typefaces that everyone else is using. Maybe then fonts and use is not the best idea because then you, f you see what everyone else is using and maybe don't try a typeface yourself. And it's always useful to try the typeface you're considering with your own content, so in your language that you need to have it, and also in the structure of the text. So you see, oh, I need different widths, I need different weights, and that is uh, giving you the realistic idea and you cannot just judge it from a specimen. And I think you should support your local type foundries and don't steal their funds because then they will make a lot more typefaces for you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, the first people who want to ask a question already up. Wir, wir sprechen einfach Deutsch weiter. Okay, ihr könnt heimgehen, ihr könnt heimgehen. Well, it got a lot better. It was really shitty at first. Um, but I mean, the recent addition is at least uh, trying to do to a really add something that was not there before, because of especially this effort they did for the non-Latin typefaces. I see that there wa weren't so many offers for specific scripts, so that is a good idea. But um, I also see all of the other sites that you could see. Yeah. Um, so at least they are paying the designer, so the designer is not always working for free. If they pay fairly, that's a different discussion, but it's, it's only free for the user. But of course, this is a lot of type designers are threatened by this offer because, as I said, uh, the price point is, is a large argument for a lot of users, and if you can have something that is decent for free, why should you pay for something else? Thank you. Any questions? They're all totally tired. <laughs> they want more beer. <laughs> oh, no. OK, sorry. <laughs> This, no, this is live stream, so you should ha uh, rush home and then, no, I think it's also recorded or something, so you could, um, okay. you can watch it again. <laughs> and, and on my website, there's a document or a, a page called links, and it has all the links again, and not really commented or explained, but all the stuff that I've mentioned, of most of the stuff, you can at least find the links and then check them out. So a lot of this is also covered by this, this the, the text on this Benton Modern site or other articles I have on my website, on my 10-year-old um, website. For that. Well, you should not check it on the phone, maybe, but. Do you know the word of Tibor Kalman? What? Tibor Kalman, yeah, uh, yeah, an, an yeah. American designer that says that when you have to um, pick up a font, he, mm, he choose exactly the perfect font for the subject, and then he turn up and he choose exactly the opposite one. Yeah. And that's the way he does design. <laughs> no, I think this is, um, I mean, I don't want to subscribe this method to everyone, but I definitely think that you should be much more daring when choosing typefaces, and don't be afraid of this. And I mean, it's only a typeface. If you, if you don't design for the local government and really important documents, there, there cannot be something really wrong, because if the people have to read it, they will read it anyway. But uh, I mean, just, just choosing a different one that is not so seen out there, or maybe breaking the conventions, that can be a really interesting uh, design idea, of course, also. Well, thank you. Uh, 
I'm not sure, in fact, if I will be able uh, uh, to speak uh, t in English with my French thought. But uh, y y uh, maybe you are from the uh, an American way of pragmatism, how to use a typeface and how to classify typeface. And I think you've forgotten, for me, I'm on the opposite side, you see. Uh, I think you've forgotten the the difference from italic to slanted, even if it's corrected, even if the, the slanted face is corrected. The, the italic uh, is the way to, to have a new language, a second language in the first language, a stranger language, or to emphasize it. So it's quite a difference. It's another person, another kind of person. And, um, when we see, li uh, when I, I'm thinking about uh, one uh, uh, type designer, which is uh, also a, a woman, Sybil Hagman, uh, with Odile, who has designed an upright italic and a classical italic. So for the typographer or for the writer, it is for example, for new writers like Sorrentino or David Foster Ballas, if the way to, to emphasize it with two different, three kind of emphasis, uh, a text, a literature, literature. And I'm also thinking uh, about uh, Susanna Lico, Lichko, who said, you read best what you read most. That's and absolutely true. Yeah, that's say. true. Yeah. And of course, y you're great your grandparents or great-grandparents were able to read in Dido, but we aren't now. We aren't absolutely. It's too hard to see all well these that's vertical. Well, not even so horrible, but my grandparents perfectly read Fraktur, and I can yeah. not read that uh, at all. Also for you yeah. in German, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking also, all the way that a new typographer, th they're not so new, L like Barnbrook with a prototype or priory, who is doing two things? He's hybrid. It's, it's a kind of hybridation, everything of forms and of thought. He's designing forms, and uh, he is designing the history of forms in the same time. Because when you look at prototype or priory, for example, you knew all his influences. You see the influences. Uh, it's a new, uh, I think it's a new word de of designing. It's uh, impossible to put it in classification. The hybridation oh. is quite impossible, I, 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 don't I think. I don't know. I mean, at least all the, the typefaces that you listed, I could, I could put, I mean, I, I rather just put them somewhere which is close. You don't have to have, uh, I don't want to have three buckets. It's never fitting. But you can more think like a pile that is like, closer to that typeface. And it's just that it's just one idea of thinking about this to help you maybe choose a typeface. There's always like things that are not fitting into the buckets and that is actually also what type designers sometimes really want to do. So something that is messing up with all the classifications. But um, I think for instance these typefaces or like the one from Barnbrook, they come with so much history built in they are also not, you can almost not use them without saying exactly that, like without saying all this this research on and the history of that style. And I mean, that's fine. It's just not something that you can load up yourself with a design so much. But when you, when you were talking about different languages, I find this is actually really discriminating to say the second language has to be italic because that means like this is you're just the second language. For instance, the Swiss would just not allow this. They would say, no, all the typefaces has have to be, like, they have to be similarly important. And you cannot take the Roman for the more important one and then maybe the two italics. They, because italic today may <coughs> means something different than another Roman typeface. So I think multilingual texts need to have also different typographic solutions than just using the italic or... Um, yeah, maybe it's a different typeface, but then it's a different voice. And do you want to say the same thing in a different language, or do you want to have a completely different voice and a, and a different message that uh, that gets across? But you have to, of course, decide if this is just not an, such an important 
language for this book or if this is like a, a multi-language country where you want to be democratic about your font choices. Mm. Yes. It, was n it was not to argue, it was just to have another point and, uh, s s um, and to speak about literature when there are several voices from the same person, the same author, you see. And uh, you need, uh, like Maurice Roche or some people, uh, some poets like that, they have, for example, six languages in one text. What? Yeah, then, then you want yeah. to have them really different, yeah. to yeah. hear the different voices. Yeah, yeah okay. It That's depends it. on the job. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Veronique needs to go home. <laughs> I was just wondering, because you come from Saarbrück, right, which is really close to France and those neighboring countries. Uh, I was just wondering, do you think that there's something very specific about German typography and about French typography? Because I go to Germany quite a lot, and I remember catching myself like uh, it was a fun experience going into a pet store and picking up like a book about kittens. It was really nicely set and like a serif typeface, you know. I was just like, you don't see it that anywhere else than oh yeah. Germany almost. I, d I don't know if like y you would confirm that or you would say there's something specifically German about typography or not. So you think that we should not use a serif typeface for kittens or for this I'll packaging? That's not what I'm yeah. saying. I was, no, I was I just saying that I was like surprised. No, I, I, I liked kittens even more at that point. Yeah, yeah I, I think <laughs> um, the different countries have different tastes for certain typefaces of certain principles. When I said that um, the Germans like these large excite typefaces and may maybe also narrower proportions and smaller capital letters, that is definitely something that um, also the German typeface designers did in the history. So I think that the typefaces are sometimes different and also sometimes you still, low, uh, you still have a little bit of a local market. So you probably just see more German typefaces in the history of Germany than um, other from other countries. But of course also the typography has to be a little different because firstly it looks completely different with the long words or you have, you have words that just have one character that doesn't exist in German. So you have like at least two or three. And then um, you also have completely different orthography. Like for instance, for me, it's always weird that you space all the punctuation. Why would you do that? Right. So it's, it's um, you, I think you can still identify it very much. Also, if it would not just be the language. And then it's just, I think, the different graphic tradition that um, maybe we have to actually see or uh, pay attention to that we don't lose this. So that you just have, if you wander around a street in France, it just looks very different because you have different signage, you have different advertising, packaging, shop fronts and stuff like this. And that is the same thing in Germany. You also have like a sign to paint up tradition or you have build up signs and stuff like this. And just in the past years when everyone is using the same digital fonts and on vinyl lettering and just sticking up, I think now it's getting more, more boring all over the place. But I actually like that I, I see it on the architecture. I immediately I often go to the supermarket in France and then you immediately see if you cross the border because everything looks different. Yeah. The, the houses look different, the signage and uh, like the type around me is different. And not even that in, in in Lorraine, they at least like across the border from Saarbrücken, they all speak decent German. I mean, in contrast to me, so it was. It's not even just the language; it's a lot of things. It's it's like all the visual culture around us, and we should we should better preserve parts of this. I would say. The last question. Short question related to culture and the books that uh, typographers read. I think the quality of uh, books and the type type books in Germany is wonderful. I know books like Lese Typographie, but my question is: some of those excellent books have never been translated in French or even in English. On the reverse, the br the book by Bringhurst is not translated in German. So, do you think that the culture of um, English? German culture, French culture, American culture for typography is based on completely different books. 
Yeah, or d completely different schools and schools of thought. So definitely I would say that because if you are trained by the people from your country, then um, you will probably produce something that is closer to this tradition as if you were trained in the US and then go back to, like if you worked with Tibor Kalman and then go back to Germany and still use that mindset, it will be something different. But I think this is, uh, this is the problem and the, luxur the luxury of the pretty large countries. I think France and Germany are large enough and have sp the number of speakers are enough to like, almost like afford their own literature. And countries like the Netherlands or, or Scandinavia, they don't have that so much. So they not only relate, um, oh no, they're not dependent on translations, but they depend on that they read an English book because there's just not so much literature in their own language. And I think France and also Germany were lazy, large countries that have enough to offer in the country and in that language themselves that, um, yeah, you could probably translate all this, but it's also a lot of effort and there's no need because there's enough books in, in your language. But yeah, as I said, if, if everyone would just be educated on, on the basis of Bringhurst, then also maybe something would all look like uh, what Ellen Lupton still says for Scala Sons or Scala. No one is using that in Germany. It's so American to me. It's like uh, everyone who just read the Bringhurst book they they do exactly that typography, and that also would be boring if like every country was was using the same books and the same teacher or or like finding the same things beautiful. I like that it's very different actually. Okay, thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you, Akaola. Uh, 15 announcements. <laughs>